Ted has appeared on EWTN, and in 1994, he and his wife started the Max Cole Institute, a non-for-profit organization that was designed to spread the word of God in devotion to the Blessed Mother. Please help me welcome a businessman who has dedicated his life to the understanding and spreading of God's word and devotion to our Blessed Mother. Please welcome Mr. Ted Flynn. Thank you. It's, it's just a nice opportunity to be back here. I was just speaking with some people that I actually stayed with, um, Doug and Doris Vining. It was about, uh, I guess, seven years ago when I was up here. And, and just even in the last hour or so, I've had the opportunity to see about a dozen people that I've met through the last few years, as well as even done pilgrimages. And uh, several people actually here were on the trip that we did last summer to Israel. But uh, several months ago, I was actually asked to speak here and did it joyfully and willingly. And they asked that if I would speak on the family. And the first thing I thought is, oh my God, you know, the family. Uh, I've got kids. Um, I've actually persevered, um, <laughs> endured. And actually, I can say this. This is a true statement from the bottom of my heart. I have two kids who have never given me 30 seconds of grief. And I consider myself, and believe me, there is such a thing as grace, and I really very much understand the concept of grace. And uh, my wife and I, we actually began to take our, which was really a conversion process, uh, very, very seriously. We were actually both very much into our faith, even when we were married, even be while we were engaged. And then I guess the booster shot was actually Medjugorje. Uh, my wife went actually, I think, the first time in 87 with her mom, and then I went in 89. We brought our kids, and then we went again actually in 19, I think it was 97. And, you know, it's just a place of grace. Uh, I remember getting off the um, bus coming up from Dubrovnik the first time and you know just literally just getting right off the bus and I said this is this God is here you know it's just something that you can understand it's a spiritual thing and there are places in the world that I think are more special than others where heaven is pouring out graces in fairly unique ways and so in thinking and it's been I guess several months since I was asked to speak on the family because the subject that I've been actually very into over the last year or so actually is on the New World Order. And it's literally appearing before our eyes, you know, on a daily basis and news basis every single day now, faster than even the day before, just as a result of the last, you know, month, we're looking at maybe national ID cards and, you know, immigration issues, and really on a macro scale, talking about really shredding the Constitution. But what can I say to a group of people that are really here as believers. This is actually the remnant church. I heard 20 some years ago that when you're speaking to the uh, self-righteous preach justice and when you're speaking to the people who are really trying to live the faith preach love. And so really it's this is a, a time of really encouragement of some of the things that I've seen throughout the world over the last 20 some years uh, having the opportunity also to speak in a lot of places, uh, meet a lot of people. And I think if I hear one single thing as I get a chance to travel and, you know, people are bringing you back and forth to airports and you're in diners and you're, you know, you're, you're in a very quiet moment or maybe even signing a book, it's the thing that I hear most on a very, very consistent basis for nearly 10 years, and it's this, I feel so alone. And you're in a diocese here which has its challenges. And you're not totally unlike many other places in the United States. I've actually been in dioceses where um, they actually had a deacon uh, consecrating. And so I turned to the person. It was actually carrot cake. It was in Hawaii. And uh, I said, well, what's going on here? They said, well, this is a communion service. And the person actually is, you know, a deacon and they're, they're consecrating the host. I said, I don't think so. 
I don't think this is the way it works. But, you know, people are in different places, and the church is stronger in some, and it's weaker in others, and uh, it's a big world and a big country. So, really, what could I say about family life that would really be meaningful? By and large, you know, people probably read, and, you know, when you read a book, you probably only over the years maybe remember one major thing from the book. That's really it. You know, what was the one major thing? Some books more than others will, but, you know, you look at your shelves at home, and can you actually say exactly what's in that book? The answer is no. But can you pinpoint maybe the spirit of that book? And the answer would be yes. And there's maybe one thing in particular. I think if we could say one thing that you would leave here, it's the issue of fundamentals. There is a great deal of confusion and fear in the marketplace right now. And probably, America has changed forever. I, uh, this, my trip actually just took, I could have driven here quicker than it was to fly here. Uh, it took me five and a half hours uh, to come up here. And I think that we're looking at a lot of things that are changed. And I'm actually leaving from Dulles, Virginia, which is only a 48-minute flight. And so, where are we at? as a world. I think if we were to take a look on a macro scale, I would think the vast majority of people here have been to Medjugorje and know of a lot of the messages. But how do we process that? The point is really not to become an apparition junkie, to just follow things, but the point is to be able to give us life. You know, how do we really deal with these messages? How do we now apply that to family life? That's what it's about. It's not really just about the head and the knowledge, but how do we process this to live abundantly? In my mid-20s, I actually saw a verse in the Gospel of John that I haven't, it, it's close to a dedication of my life, and it's where the, uh, uh, I come to give you life and give it more abundantly. And I had the opportunity in a very, very, in a young age to be around certain people in Washington, D.C. who were having a very, very significant impact on the gospel message through the National Prayer Breakfast Movement where I was actually a fellow for one year in, involved with national student leadership. It, it started one day uh, and it ended 365 days and then you knew you were gone and you'd do something else. But I was around a lot of people who were having an impact and they seemed to have a mindset that was very, very positive. How do you really have an impact in your own life to be able to live an abundant life. I come to give you life and give it more abundantly. Many people are not living abundant lives. There's actually a verse that every single person here can say to a varying degree that it impacts them or it doesn't. And it was actually at a point in the Gospel of Matthew to where Jesus was going to the cross. He knew he was very close. It was just before he was going into Jerusalem. And he said to his friend Peter, the great swordsman, best he could do is cut off an ear. And so they all had their own weaknesses, just as we do. And he said to Peter, Peter, Simon Barjona, who do you say that I am? And then Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then Jesus said to him, and he said, it has not been flesh and blood who has revealed that to you, but my Father who is in heaven. That single verse, that single statement, separated Peter from another man and another person in the world because he had come to the point, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He didn't say, Jesus didn't say to him, who does the moral philosopher say that I am? Who do the members of the Sanhedrin say that I am? The local Pharisees and the Sadducees, the lawgivers, where the Lord said they're white-watered sepulchers. Everything was on the outside for the appearance. Who do you say that I am? That single question separates every single person from anybody else. Who does your mother say? Who does your father say? Who does your colleague say? That's the great distinguishing question in all of history. And Jesus specifically said his mission was to proclaim the truth, John 18, 37. My mission is to proclaim the truth. If you take a look at the, actually the story of the apostles and the disciples, 11 out of the 12 died violent deaths. 
Every single time you take a look at Paul, he's being beat up. He's being dropped over the wall in a basket. He's in chains. He's being shipwrecked. They're trying to kill him. They're on their way. He's, a, he's actually going before the ruling body as a Roman citizen, even in Rome, before Augustus and Agrippa. It was a life of difficulty. And if you take a look at the book of Acts, which I've actually read the book of Acts now twice over the last three months. It's 28 chapters, so if you do about a chapter a day. What you see in the book of Acts, and I'd never quite seen it like this, is that the conversion process is actually very violent. Take a look at that with that eye as you read through. It's an incredibly violent book. Peter and John are in jail and all of a sudden the angel comes in, takes the manacles off them, and then they appear before the other disciples and they think it's a ghost. They're trying to kill him. They're trying to persecute him. And this took place actually after Pentecost. So when the Holy Spirit came, there was a greater infusion of grace. And that's kind of when the rubber hit the road. That's when it got very, very difficult. And Paul says in Acts 26, 21, the reason they're trying to kill me is because I'm bringing people to repentance. So what you can see by that is that a person is either in Christ or out of Christ. They're either in the light or out of the light. They're either converted or they're not. But what happens so many with us, that there's a chamber in our heart to where we're kind of willing to go to a certain chamber where the Lord will ask us to maybe do something, and then we'll do it. And the Lord may say, well, how about this? And then we'll maybe do that. But then it gets a little bit more difficult. Well, are we willing to go to this chamber? Well, this one will cost you. This one may cost you more emotionally. This one may cost you more financially. This one may cost you more with your time. You may not play quite as much golf, or you may not do the things you want to do. So it all boils down to a conversion process, which is the absolute fundamental aspect of our faith. I'd like to tell a story of why, why I think families are, have been successful and tell the story of two separate families that I have known for upwards of 20 years. One family has two children. There is virtually nothing right in the family. The father has never prayed, John 17, of all that I have is yours, mine are thine and thine are mine those that you have given me. There has never been a conversion in the house, and so as a result of that, they have never really had God's best or, the, or abundant living. The kids are absolute brats from the word go. As soon as they walk in the house, they're just absolutely nothing but unruly, whether you're in their house or their house. But what it boils down to is the parents. The parents have never really had the conversion process, so why would we expect the kids to be anything different? The girl actually right now, or one of their girls, is about 14 or 15, and she's dressing like she's Britney Spears, you know. And so it doesn't take really a, a rocket scientist here to see where this, these kids are going to be headed. And so they actually had a conversion of, of the faith to where, you know, they actually asked if we would be involved with them in several capacities. And we were, and we went to church with them once. We brought them once. That was seven years ago. And w when they come in, and you know, we're very, very friendly with them. But then we'll say, you know, you know uh, how are the kids doing? What did they think was set at church? And they said, oh, they didn't really want to go, and I was tired. So there really hasn't been any sort of conversion process in their own life. And so school's not going well. There's discipline problems. She whines. The kids whine. Nothing is right because there really hasn't been a circumcision of the heart. And then there's another family who do doesn't really have maybe 25%. This guy's a big businessman in DC. And that's part of the problem of the inordinate uh, pursuit of wealth and money and the neglect of the children for what he thinks is gonna make them, you know, maybe a very happy guy later on. And then there's another family with six kids. Well, the kids are involved in everything the parents do. They are a church together. They're persevering. They're actually as a family in Eucharistic adoration. The kids are actually all in tremendous activities. And when you walk in the home, 
It has an, is an aura and spirit of peace. So who does it come back to? It comes back to the parents. If you want to take a look many times at what the kids are, it's the parents. And the lament actually is that uh, due to the division that is in families, there are a lot of things that aren't quite perfect. And so speaking to the people who are really trying to persevere, I think if there is the sticking of the fundamentals, then I think the families may not be absolutely perfect because everybody is carrying a burden. I think if I've realized one thing over the last, maybe particularly in the last 10 years, of why we can never judge another human being is because when you get to know them on an absolute intimate basis, there's absolutely a cross that somebody's bearing many times that we now understand why they're like they are. So it's best not to judge for that reason because once you get in those one-on-one -on -one settings, many times in, in the conversation goes to the spiritual level or the agape level, I hurt. Because most conversations actually take place of whether or not the, you know, the Yankees beat the Oakland A's and they trade information at the water cooler. The next level of, of communication is actually at the level of, well, you know, my kids just got bees and, you know, we're going to the baseball game and, you know, it may be a little bit more intimate. But the next level of conversation is the spiritual level of, I hurt. I need to do something. My marriage isn't quite right. What should I do? You go to somebody who is a trusted friend and you begin to seek the answers of what is God's mind. Because there's really only three ways to look at any single issue on the entire planet. As I see it, as others see it, and as God sees it. And when we look at it as we see it, many times the way our periscope goes up, it's not quite perfect. Because due to our own culture, our own ethnicity, our own experiences, our own limited capacity to process and digest information, we may not get the perfect answer. And that's what um, the last verse in the book of Judges is, is that every man did that which is right in his own eyes. So we won't get God's best. Another problem is others see it. What is the other person's view on life? How do they look at things? Are they actually seeking the wisdom of God? Well, actually, I would only be confidant with a few people and not really try to be friends with the whole world, but really seek the advice of those that are actually really seeking God in praying and discerning, fasting, and getting God's best from heaven to know what to do. So in the ultimate of fundamentals, it just boils down to what should be done many times versus what we should do. Many times we're just off kind of picking daisies. We're just virtually all over the place. You know, is there the daily prayer and the other things that are being asked for? In the issue of fundamentals, I was thinking about this to where there's a story that when I was 14 years old, I actually played on a hockey team from Cranston, Rhode Island that were national champions in Washington, D.C. It was a Bantam League, and uh, we won the national championship, and, and every single team uh, that we beat was actually from Canada or right around the Detroit border. And I look back over the years on that and see how that happened and where a lot of the kids went and how that evolved. And this isn't so much a story about hockey, but about the fundamentals. And Sports Illustrated tracked this team seven years ago to where a lot of these people ended up because as a result of that team at 14, 13, 14, 15 year old Bantams, four people went on to play in the National Hockey League and one was the first American to break the 50 goal barrier, American born. His name was Kurt Bennett from Cranston, Rhode Island. He played with the Atlanta Flames. Three tried out for the Olympic team, one made it. Four played for teams in Europe, and nearly every single kid made all state and went on to uh, Division I hockey. And what happened and how that evolved was through one man and this is how we can apply this to the fundamentals of our own faith in our own family, our own domestic church. There was a man in the very early 60s by the name of Dick McLaughlin. If he's alive today, he'd probably be about 87, 88 years old. And we actually played in a little place called the Ice Bowl. It's about 
w maybe even about one half the size of what would be a regulation rink today. And all the person taught was the fundamentals of skate, shoot, pass. All he taught was the fundamentals. And there was a game once, we were actually sponsored by a liquor store by the name of Mickey Stevens. It's a liquor store sponsor. And there was a person who ended up actually, he was the first person to make all state for three years in the state of Rhode Island. And when he was, you know, just very, very young as a peewee, he did something really, really stupid. And the coach during a game just sat the kid down for two straight games. He never said a word. He came in, he said, you're not supposed to do that. We've talked about it many times. He sat him down and the kid never saw the ice for two straight games. And naturally he started whining, but you didn't whine with this guy because he was the coach and it was the way it was. And you go back and you take a look at what were the absolute fundamentals and that's what was produced from this man. Now what also came from that story is there was a school called Mount St. Charles in Woonsocket, Rhode Island where several of the kids went to play high school hockey. That school has produced in the history of the United States the greatest winning record in high school athletics according to Sports Illustrated. Because what it's become actually is a magnet school. It's a private Catholic school. They've had uh, NHL drafts, you know, number one kids right out of high school. But it became a magnet school where people would actually room and board up there. And it was actually unfair in a school system, but it's the way it, it is, you know, because the Catholic schools can do that. But the point of the story is it started with one man many years ago who taught the absolute fundamentals and generationally now and this is what it's produced. Very, very few people could track that and very few people would even care nonetheless. But when it goes back to a person teaching the fundamentals, good things happen. What are the absolute fundamentals? That's, I think, some of the things that we've got to ask ourselves. In 1998, um, there, was the, there was actually a census released and I'd like to read actually just some of the, the uh, family data that came out of the 1998 census in America, not too long ago. Households headed by unmarried partners grew 72% last decade. This is America. Households headed by single mothers or fathers increased 25% and 62% respectively. Now this is the big one, if you want to know, understand why America is where it is. Nuclear families dropped below 25% of households in the U.S. Nuclear families dropped below 25% of households in the United States. That is not a very encouraging statistic for the state of the, of the world because the absolute incubator for the faith is the domestic church and whether or not there's nurturing. Other studies show cohabitation increased 1,000% from 1960 to 1998. Households headed by same-sex couples is soaring. If you come across and against what's politically correct today, you'll be marginalized and ostracized to where you're just not with it. More unmarried women in their 20s and 30s are choosing to raise children alone. And this is the, the reason for the domestic church. The divorce rate is as high among born-again Christians as the general population for the first time in history of the United States, according to Dr. James Dobson, a focus on the family. What does this all mean? Where are we really headed? It means the family is unraveling faster than ever. The culture is abandoning the concept of a scriptural marriage as a sacrament. The youth don't really know what God intends because they don't even have a point of reference even in their own home. God is irrelevant in their lives, a non-factor. You could never, ever, ever have The Simpsons on primetime television unless you had a complete moral breakdown. Uh, could you imagine maybe the people who are at X age here, of maybe Ozzie and Harriet, uh, Make Room for Daddy, The Ed Sullivan Show, and the different programs, if all of a sudden you left the United States and went to live on a, on a deserted island with Rip Van Winkle, and then all of a sudden you came back maybe last week and to see what would happen in television. Actually, most of the fathers in America would have bashed it in with a baseball bat. 
That's exactly what would have happened. But we've been drowning inch by inch. We've been being numb to death. And actually, we don't even know it. That's what's been happening in our living rooms, to where we think these things are normal. Well, I think deity thinks the opposite. America is a degraded society. Specifically, our problem is what the ancients called acedia. It is a spiritual lethargy in absence of zeal for divine things. Acedia arises from a heart steeped in the worldly and the carnal and from low self-esteem of divine things. The consequences is a coarseness, a callousness, a cynicism, a banality, and a vulgarity to our time. All you've got to do is look at the youth today and see exactly how true that is. You don't see body piercings, tattoos, and to look like that if you actually have a vision for life and where God intends us to be. No one will live like that. According to a pollster, a Christian pollster by the name of George Barna, this is actually from Focus on the Family Data, um, he reveals that if a child hasn't been introduced to Jesus by the time he or she is 14, there is a 4% chance that a conversion will happen by the years 14 to 18, and a 6% chance that it will happen in the remainder of their life. That's exactly why we need to get the youth very, very young and introduce them, and that's actually why this subject is such a tremendous subject. It's the absolute root of the church floundering or flourishing or prospering or absolutely going down a point of no return. On a historical basis from the great civilizations in front of us by the people like Toynbee, Arnold Toynbee, Yakuta, Will and Ariel Durant of the story of civilization, um, uh, Edward Gibbon, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, which is just chronicling that. There's been 22 great civilizations in front of us, and this is actually what I go into in Hope of the Wicked on the New World Order things, but actually if you take a look at America, we're in serious, serious trouble. There's virtually no doubt of that. You know, in the magnanimous way of Manhattan people at Planned Parenthood after the Twin Towers went up, Planned Parenthood decided it would be just a magnanimous gesture to offer every woman who came into their clinic a free abortion. That was last week. I see a very, very inconsistent thing with the flag waving, which is nationalism is good, sovereignty is a good thing. It's very necessary for the human culture to many times exceed boundaries. But I see it very, very inconsistent when I see nobody talking about repentance. I see where the, you know, the greatest form of rulership in the history of the world is a benign dictatorship like King David. But I see nobody putting on sackcloth and ashes. Six days after the Twin Towers went up, right on national television Monday night, Dharma and Greg, two gays were married on the show. They married two gays. That same day, in Congress, they actually passed same-sex benefits for same-sex, or benefits for same-sex partners in Congress for Washington, D.C. There's a very, very inconsistent thing. We've got to get away from what we see in the newspaper, and that's why the Blessed Mother has said to people like Father Gobi and others, stay away from the materialism because this way you'll be able to process and filter more in a way that is of God versus being polluted with the things that we're seeing on television. I'd like to actually take a look at what I think is the single greatest impediment to family life, absolutely bar none. If I were to ask people here what is the single greatest social issue of the day when Jesus walked the earth, many people would say it was the issue of Roman occupation. Jesus never addressed it. The greatest social issue of the day, or like abortion, was Roman occupation. And they asked him actually what, how he should deal with taxes and he gave only a one word answer. He said, give to God what is of God and give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Jesus was about the heart, whether it's the woman at the well, whether it's Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come down off that tree, I'm going to your house tonight for dinner. He absolutely saw no boundaries, whether he's with a prostitute like Mary Magdalene, whether he's with a creep like Matthew who was a traitor to his people, being a person collecting taxes for a foreign power. But everything he did was to touch the heart. 
Everything he did was touch the heart. And that's what it's about, that if we're feeding totally the mind, we're not going to get God's best in our families. The greatest impediment today to family life that was as great as this, the issue of Jesus is without a doubt the television set. Nothing in this world is as destructive as TV. But what's happened, we've begun to be numb to that process. If I've made one single good decision with many, many bad decisions of raising my children and, you know, um, nearly weeping at some times over things that I did that I shouldn't have done, and uh, the Lord redeeming, because I've had to go to my kids on many, many occasions, will you forgive me? Now, first of all, you know, my son always makes me grovel. <laughs> he said, I'll think about it, come back in an hour, you know. <laughs> but um, unless, the, unless the kids see actually forgiveness where the parents are asking it in front of the kids, they'll never understand it. In their, why should they understand it somewhere else than the Our Father? And the single best decision I've ever made on the practical side is actually very much limiting TV. We have one. It isn't something that it's locked up. But we use it for PBS specials, we use it for videos, we use it to exhort. And we're very, very limited in how we did that. And it's not a gene thing, but I consider actually why my kids were very good students. I actually limited the television in a major way. We happen to be actually a tennis family. We we're all very much into tennis. And that was actually the outlet that we all actually did. And that kept us together and we went to tournaments together and, you know, uh, they played in junior tournaments. but. Um, the thing that I did that was by far the best decision ever in our house with them growing up and my son's 18 and my, my daughter's 20 and they've talked about it is limiting the television. I'd actually like to read four things from Father Gobi that is specifically spoken about for the television. And uh, I find it interesting, I looked, there's a concordance to MMP and I actually went back and looked to see where every single time it was mentioned, television in MMP, and it was mentioned 10 times. And what was most interesting, it was the very, it was the sixth sentence. And it came from July 8, 1973, of the second message ever given by Father Gobi to the world. And here's what was said. Uh, I'll read actually four of these. And this is called, The Movement is Now Born. The sixth sentence, but there was one previous, but it, it'll happen like the second sentence here. Look at neither the newspapers nor television. Remain ever close to my heart of prayer. Nothing else should be of interest or importance to you save living with me and for me. The Marian movement of priests is now born, but it is so frail and small that in order to grow it has need of much prayer. Here's a message several years later. Immorality is spreading like a flood of filth and being propagated by the means of social communication, especially the cinema, the press, and television. By means of the last mentioned television, a subtle and diabolical tactic of seduction and corruption has found its way into every family. The most defenseless victims are children and youth whom I look upon with the tender preoccupation of a mother. We don't want to get into the statistics of television because we could go ad nauseum on that, but I think actually the television is, is on in the average American family eight hours a day. And I think on weekends it's ten and a half. And, you know, NFL Sunday from about 11 in the morning all the way to about 10 or 11 at night. And this is why the church is weak. This is why there's no prayer. This is why there isn't time for what's most important because... Go without television. For, do it for a week. Watch what happens. Your spirit will soar because the news is actually all depressing. You know, that's, that's very, very common. If a person's actually depressed, many times the first thing a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a doctor will tell a person, stay away from the news. Another message, 374 of Gobi. Lastly, I ask you to remove yourselves far from anything that can contaminate the purity of your heart and the chastity of your life. Do not take part in profane shows. Do not waste time before the television set, which is the most powerful instrument in the hands of my adversary, in spreading everywhere the darkness of sin and impurity. 
This actually, I remember the first time I read this because this is actually the idol spoken of in the book of Revelation. And this is actually many times where the Protestants have a very, very different view of the Catholic interpretation of Revelation because the Blessed Mother's been busting it open to Father Gobi, the black beast of Freemasonry, the red dragon of communism, and the idol of the world is literally the television set. Television is the idol spoken of in the book of Revelation built to be adored by all the nations of the earth into which the evil one gives shape and movement so that it might become in his hands a terrible means of seduction and perversion. The last one, 412. Never as today have immorality and impurity and obscenity been so continually propagandized through the press and all the means of social communication. Above all, television has become the perverse instrument of a daily bombardment with obscene images directed to corrupt the purity of the life of the mind and the heart of all. The places of entertainment, in particular the cinema and the discotheques, have become places of public profanation of one's human and Christian dignity. Look at the action words, look at the adjectives of how strong the Queen of Heaven the spokesperson of the Holy Trinity is specifically saying about one thing that is in every single home in America and many times several television sets. Perverse, bombardment, obscene images, corrupt, the purity. Those are really, really strong words. You know. So this is how the faith actually works its way down more actually to the practical level of, you know, what are we really to do? I think that if I were the devil and I were looking to have this final battle where I was going to battle the woman clothed with the sun, and the, and the devil is a pretty shrewd guy. I mean, he's had a lot of history uh, to be able to perfect his techniques, and we've got to be very, very wary of that. I mean, anybody doesn't think there's a devil uh, has been actually spending too much time in front of DVDs because literally... When Jesus was, being, was, was in his fast, at the end of his 40 days, he, he was a very, very weak creature for sure in the flesh. But spiritually, you soar. And that's why fasting is good for discernment, because you soar. Because, because the neglect of the flesh, the spirit takes over. And that's why there's much greater discernment when a per person fasts for what to do. But what I would have done if I were the devil, I would have invented the television. Think about it, you, uh, of, of, of just being piped in day after day, year after year, decade after decade. We don't even know that we're submerged underwater. Mother Seton, in the early 1870s, as the foundress of the Catholic parochial school system in America, working with the Bishop of Baltimore, actually had an image of a black box in everybody's home creating a situation of impurity and destroying the church in America. Wow. See a lot of heads. That's exactly what it's doing. So we wonder why we're not really fighting with the armor of God. And it's because, you know, as Matthew was speaking earlier about habits, I actually heard, uh, does anybody think they got bad habits? I see two hands. Actually, you don't have any bad habits. They've got you. And it's a question, really, of changing the habits, sitting down in silence, deciding what is most important, viewing our life against divinity, possibly against versus our next-door neighbor, of what they think about us. Well, if we're measuring ourselves against our neighbor, we could possibly look very, very good, you know. But um, with all of this confusion and everything that's in our midst, how do we really interpret the signs of the times? What are we really to do? Well, Jesus specifically said, tear down this temple, John 2.19. Tear down this temple, and in, two, in three days I'll build it back up. Nobody understood what that meant. Actually, the Pharisees said, how can this be? It took 46 years to build this temple. Well, even the disciples and the apostles only understood that at resurrection. 
All prophecy has a veil over it. We're never going to understand the full and the entire truth. We're going to get little bits and pieces. And once we know the sequence, we know there's going to be a warning and an illumination and a viso and enlightenment, and that's actually going to change world history. But the point is, is how are we living our daily lives? I've actually been criticized, um, you know, of being too much into apparitions. Well, actually, over the last three years, I haven't been reading any. All I've been re is reading really scripture to see what the mind of God is. And you can see in scripture that the apostles really never fully understood what was going to happen, and neither do we. We're not going to figure it out. The greatest parlor game probably among the Marian crowd is, you know, guessing the warning. Well, we know the miracle is between the months of March, April, May, and, you know, between the 8th and the 16th and 8.30 p.m. in Spanish time. And, you know, so that's, be that's kind of past now, especially as the dating game has ended, because, um, especially with the Jubilee coming and going, because many people thought things would happen. But how is the domestic church? I actually spoke last week. We actually sponsored this thing at the Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, which we've done for nine years, called the Week of Prayer and Fasting. I believe we're past the war of words now. We've got to put it into the armor of God of how, as Father Gobi said, more is accomplished through one day of prayer than in a year of negotiation. You know, imagine if the Palestinians and the Jews thought about it like that, or the Northern Irish in Ulster, Belfast. You know, so more is accomplished through one day of prayer than a virtual year. So we can see when Jesus was tempted, who came to visit him? The devil. And to make it short, he said, all of the kingdom and the power in the world is mine to give you if you bow down and worship me. Well, that specifically says there are people who accept that through commission. I believe there are certain world leaders and people that say yes to that power through commission, but 99.999% of the world actually just adopt that through an ideology of humanism that has actually passed that now to uh, practical and theoretical atheism versus humanism. We're way, way past that term of philosophy years ago, secular humanism. Now, it's actually a state religion now because of the strength of the separation of church and state. But see, what happens when man gets in a pickle, churches fill up. That's what we saw in the last month. Now, probably a lot of people here go to daily mass. Four or five days after the bombing of the Twin Towers, the, the daily communicants were back to the same people. Love grows cold. One day, the manna is falling from the sky in the desert. They're dancing in jubilation, leaving Egypt. No more having to make bricks with no water. Forty days later, they're building a golden bull. So man has to look and always continue to focus in on what is the most mundane. And that's many times the dry places, and that's where we actually find God in the dry places. I've gone through periods of my life where I felt God was leading me around literally through a rope through the nose and dragging me, and this is where you're supposed to be. I'm actually coming off several years of not knowing what I'm even to do. You know, and you know, I've talked to s several priests about it, and, and one in particular said, meet your dryness head on. It'll pass. But actually now that I, and I'm actually coming out of a very dry phase, and this is where I feel as if I've actually grown most in, in the dryness. And to the people who think they're alone, all through history, whether you want to take a look at the Old Testament or whether you want to bring it into the New Testament or whether you want to look at anything from the birth of Christ, all through history, God uses small numbers. It's the way it is. I used to always just moan and groan and whine, like, where are the people? And, you know, where, you know, my, my first thing I want to do and whine when I get to heaven is why aren't more people doing things? That's my lament, you know. We got a lot of people, you know, wanting things right, but uh, on the other hand, they don't really want to give up some comforts. So that's, I like, that's the way I like to whine. But take a look at the book of Judges. Judges, seventh chapter. The Lord starts out with an army of Gideon, and it starts out at 32,000. And then it goes down to 10,000. He whittles it in a, what seems to be a very indiscriminate process, actually. It doesn't seem to be any deep meaning behind the way it was just whittled, but some just left. 
And then actually said, Gideon said, we're going to go into battle. And the Lord said, no, you've got too many people. Because Gideon, you think you'll do, you, you did it. There's actually no allegorical meaning to that and no conjecture. It's very, very clear. The Lord specifically said to Gideon, you'll think you did it and you want it. We're going to show the world it's my glory. So I think those that go down and lap the water up like dogs, that will be your army. And it went from 32,000 to 300. So that's a little over 1%. I can't help but think as I travel around and talk to people that the church actually doesn't really have a whole lot more of the extremely faithful. There are about 55 million Catholics in the United States. And what percent would be maybe willing to fall on a sword and march? I don't know. You know, pick a number. I think it's possibly about maybe 4%, 3% that would really, really believe. And there's different charisms of believing. There's, you know, there's different things for different personalities. There are people who are legionnaires, and there are people who maybe who opus day, who maybe wouldn't really endorse anything to do with uh, the Marian side of things. Well, God bless them. As long as they're being faithful, encourage one another. There's actually three types of people in the world. There are actually people wherever you go, and, and uh, this is actually a little bit even out of anthropology as well. There are people that no matter where you go, they poison the well. We all know people like that. You ever get around a person, all they do is complain. All they want to do is nothing's right. And they divide relationships. Right out of Plato. Well, when somebody's saying something, right out of Plato in human nature, well, yes, but if they only knew that, they wouldn't say that. Yes, but. Well, you know, have you ever considered this? Well, it's all our frame of reference. So there are people, actually, who poison the well no matter where we are. And are we that? Are we forgetting a lot of our human nature to where we can encourage? Then there are also the second group of people that they really want a white picket fence and they want to wash their cars on Sunday. And that's not, nothing negative about keeping your possessions nice. I've actually been in several houses of Mother Teresa uh, throughout the world, in, in Belarus and different places. And the first thing you notice is it's spot clean. It's very, very clean, you know. But there, it's, it's, this, it's a different thing. But there are people who are just kind of content to go to work, to go to maybe the, the shopping center, and they want to make sure their grass maybe looks like, you know, Augusta National, you know. Uh, and there are people like that, as a matter of fact. And we found out that from sometimes walking our dog, <laughs> that uh, we haven't been the best citizens on occasion. But um, they're just happy kind of doing their thing. And they're not evil, but they're not necessarily disciples or apostles either. And then there's the third person who I would suspect most of the people here are trying to become. And that's actually an encourager. And these, these are actually very, very good because it gets the person to see, it's an opportunity for the individual to see that you're not nuts. We've all thought that. You know, are we really crazy here? You know, we don't know many people thinking the things that we're doing. You know, uh, can this be? You know, am I a little off base? But are you an encourager? And these, these settings are actually opportunities where great friendships have been born. If you really want to take a look at what this is, in many aspects, aspects it's a, it's a Christian tailgate party. <laughs> you know, they're going to have lunch, and they're going to meet new friends, and, oh, yes, I'm at that church. Well, you know that person? Well, they believe, well, this, this priest is very much, you know, he's someone we can talk to about that. And it's an opportunity in a very, very positive way to network. That's what a lot of the conferences are about. And hopefully it's a little bit of a hypodermic needle and a shot to where we go back and we try to exceed our own flesh in many respects, to, 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 to change habits and to become really what God wants and to, I come to give you life and give it more abundantly. I actually have been so blessed that it's actually, it, it, the, the things that I've been able to do and the people that I've been able to meet, it's really just almost been all through the gospel message. I've got some great, great relationships and friends and, and I really attribute it to to meeting a lot of people like yourself 
who are trying to make a difference. It's, the, it's kind of the encouraging group. So what are the fundamentals? The fact of the matter is we know them, but we don't do them. The fundamentals, first and foremost, is what is God saying to me? How can I communicate with God and I can hear God? So are we in prayer? So you can ask yourself where you're at. I've failed miserably. I mean, I've gone through a period of time where I couldn't even say a rosary, you know. I mean, it's just, you know, here we go again. You know, and, and there's different phases that we go through of, of down and we're up. But it's a question of really persevering to the end where Paul says, I fought the good fight. Because actually it's our only option to really persevere and fight the good fight. So are we in prayer wherever? Is there the rosary which the Blessed Mother has specifically said it is the chain to fight Satan? The devils are unleashed according to the great mystics of the world in a way that they've never been unleashed before. And these statistics on the family seem to indicate that because there seems to be a confluence of events politically, socially, economically. Well, just take a look what's happened in 30 days in America. What would happen if something much more dramatic happened? And how quickly things could change? Is this really what heaven's been trying to communicate in preparation? Is this what it's been saying? Is the mass the center of your life? You know, different dioceses have different challenges with different issues. We actually have it very, very easy here. I spent four years in the Soviet Union on power projects with the World Bank, and, and I, I actually had dinner actually with, a, with Cardinal Svantec of Minsk, who spent 17 years in hard labor. Didn't waffle in his faith. So we think many times we've got it difficult. We have to actually go out, and we've got to, wherever we can be fed, we've got to find it. If, if you don't have a mass at such and such a place that you should, maybe a 10-minute drive, drive 30 minutes. It absolutely has to be the center of what we're doing or else we're going to perish. You really won't make it unless it's the daily chores and the daily prayers and the daily everything that we're called to do. Is there monthly confession as every one of the major apparition sites have asked for? Well, you know, the graces just can't penetrate. If there's a single thing that I've seen that is probably the most important for grace to begin to penetrate, it's going to confession. Because it's kind of like somebody holding an umbrella. You know, it, the, 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 the rays of grace just can't penetrate. You know, if it's raining, you're just going to be protected from that. But if, if, if the Lord is trying to communicate, he can't communicate with really a clouded soul. And we get the experience in the Catholic Church to wipe it white as snow, and especially through the, the promises of St. Faustina. So it's a question of really enduring. We seem to be at a very, very critical point in world history. A lot is happening, and even several people have come up to me in the last hour or two that it seems that a lot of the events are actually going at a very, very dramatic speed right now. And what's happening? It's actually coming to a place um, in the world where unless we're firmly grounded in our faith, in the domestic church, what's most important? Realizing that nothing is perfect. There are people here with spouses who are unbelievers. There are people here enduring their own thing. If you persevere, God will bless it. I've actually only begun to fully understand in the last few years the depths of God, God's mercy. I've never, it, was, it was a little bit more of an intellectual concept for me of, of understanding just how profound God's mercy really is. And our own martyrdom may be a dry one. It may be you know, the silence in the home due to a relative or a spouse not necessarily thinking like you're thinking. But I'll tell you this. As St. Monica prayed for St. Augustine, if there's prayer, sacrifice, penance, fasting for an individual, it's only a matter of time. They're marking time. We've been given that promise. I've watched actually every member of my family over the last 24 years come around. 
some never speaking. I have a sister, actually, who's just turned 50, and I hope she never gets this tape. But uh, <laughs> because she didn't want that known. Well, she's only three years as a result of a situation with her son that has brought her to her knees. And as a result of that, she's now growing like a weed. And that's actually the result of just a lot of prayer over the years for a person who just didn't seem to have much interest in it. But the circumstances demanded some changes. And actually the family's doing much, much better right now. So I would say the fundamentals is where it's at. It's a question of just focusing in on what we know is most important, letting the Lord do his work, the absolute fundamentals, and it will work out. And remember, even if the truth is only spoken by one, it's still the truth. Thank you very much.